called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. In order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that someone should rise from the dead. When I first thought about preaching this today, I had not yet lost one that I consider a great mentor and friend. But uh, Ed Harrell died this last week, otherwise known as David Edwin Harrell Jr. And if I were to count probably on one hand, people that I respected who've influenced my thought process in terms of what I believe and teach, Ed Harold probably would be on that list, one of the fingers. He was one of the preeminent historians of modern American history. And when he was on Good Morning America one time, they introduced him as being the foremost historian of American religious history in the country. There were four sectors of his public life besides family that in which he influenced great swaths of people. Number one, the academy. He was one of the most respected, again, American, and in particular the American church history uh, historians in the country. Did a lot of work on, on Pentecostalism. He wrote biographies of Pat Robertson and Oral Roberts. All Things Are Possible was a book on Pentecostal history. But he also wrote about American religious uh, restoration history, the Churches of Christ in America. He wrote the best book on 20th century history of Churches of Christ in, in the United States of America. And a number of other books related to that. He wrote books about the American South. He was a Southerner and, and wrote uh, books about race, race relations in the South. Um, and so extremely well respected. He had taught at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, Auburn University, University of Arkansas, and um, was at conferences all over the country. And I would bump into him at some of those conferences. But he also decided to preach part time wherever he could in gospel meetings all over the country. And he probably held as many gospel meetings <laughs> as just about anybody. And he would hold his history conferences and then preach on the side for some church somewhere. And uh, beginning with the early 1980s, he did a, a lectureship at Fairview and Garden Grove with Dee Bowman. And they became kind of a pair from that moment forward. And they even did it locally at, at Miller Avenue, San Jose. Um, Dee Bowman was the flashy one. Ed Harrell would, told the simple stories and jokes. And so people would sometimes confuse D. Bowman as, as the one with the PhD and Ed Harrell as the, as the country uh, person from Texas, which he was not. Um, but uh, I, I would bump into him in meetings and have him in meetings where I, I preached. 
early in the 80s, as they were in one of those meetings at, at Fairview at Garden Grove, he proposed to Dee that they start a magazine. It was called Christianity Magazine, and Ed was the brains behind that endeavor. It became a very prominent publication, and much of his life was in, invested in the good that that magazine did in the 1980s and 1990s. And there were these young startups who had started a magazine, Focus Magazine. He took over what was left of Christianity when uh, when that uh, folded. I was one of those editors. So again, I had relations with him that way and always look forward to reading his, his material. And then finally, uh, one final area where he did a lot of good is that uh, toward the end of his professional life, he decided that he would do some good overseas and he became uh, an eminent scholar in residence at the University of Hyderabad. And um, tried to work with Indian churches on the side and uh, had great influence there. His main motive in going to India was not to be a professional scholar. That was the pretext for getting over there. Um, and he influenced all kinds of, of preachers and churches in India and continued to do so toward till the end of his life. He would take trips over there um, and encourage other Americans to go. So in this funeral that they had yesterday morning, um, they did it online. They, they had a, a graveside funeral on Wednesday, but then they did a, an online. And there were people from India, Germany, from Seychelles, where uh, Robert and Andrea Smith started the church years ago. Um, and all over the United States of America, and people tuning in from all over the world. They piped in singing from choirs and congregations singing a cappella when they would put the PowerPoints up there. I thought, man, <laughs> we had to do this over again. I'd, I'd recommend uh, doing that. Uh, it was quite impressive. People could sing along. And then uh, they had different speakers who were some of the most respected preachers and teachers in the country giving three minute or less snippets of remembrances and then interspersed with songs. And then at the very end, this thing went over two hours, but at the very end, they uh, uh, had a recording of a sermon that he did just when you thought the funeral was over. <laughs> Uh, a half hour recording that Ed had done, just vintage Ed Harrell, packaged stories with humor and powerful spiritual lessons. And a few pictures in there of uh, Ed on Seychelles with one Robert Smith, Andrea's first husband. And uh, so he was one of the few where my family had major connections and Andrea's family had major connections. And Andrea's first husband, Robert, when he died, they were in Jacksonville, Florida, where working with, with Ed Harrell. And uh, toward the end, as, as you saw this, this half hour sermon, there were pictures throughout his life of a vibrant Ed Harrell at conferences, looking, you know, mingling with some very famous people, as well as some humble New Testament Christians all over the world. And, um, um, and then very healthy, you know, young pictures and all the way through his life till he get, till he got older. And, and then, and then toward the very end of that sermon, they included something you almost never see at a, at a funeral or a memorial service. They included some pictures of Ed on his deathbed. By intention, 
This is the whole cycle of this life, and then it's over. This young, healthy scholar, one of the most famous historians in the country, is now on his deathbed. And they included some anecdotes of friends and family. One of the last prayers that he said during the last week of his life, a man who had accomplished so much in life and written so many books and helped to start hundreds of churches and had so much influence over so many people, including yours truly. One of his last prayers, the last thing he said in the prayer, I've done the best that I could. End of the prayer. I want to be able to say that. I've done the best I could. I haven't always. When we consider Luke 16 this morning, I want you to begin heading for the home stretch of life so that you can end your last prayer. Conscious after death, that was one of the questions we were wrestling with the other day. I think so. I know there's a case to be made on the other side of that point. But I certainly think we're conscious, even in the intermediate state prior to the judgment day. There are just too many evidences for me when you put them on top of one another and make a composite whole. You've got the rich man and Lazarus. Conversations that were taking place. Some dismiss that to parable, but I don't think it's a parable. And you don't have this kind of detail in any other parable of Jesus. And even if it were a parable, parables reflect some facet of real life whenever Jesus told them. But you never read about a parable that has a man's name in it. This one has Lazarus's name. Abraham is there. You have the promise to the good thief on the cross, read in your hearing just a moment ago. Today you will be with me in paradise. That would be an empty promise if this man was not conscious after he passed to the other side. You have Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. How could that be if there's not consciousness after death? You have the 24 elders around the throne, probably representative of the 12 patriarchs, the 12 sons of Jacob, and the 12 apostles in Revelation 4 and 5. You have Jesus' promise to saints in the seven churches of Asia Minor, particularly at the end of chapter 2 and the end of chapter 3, that, that if you stay with this, if you are faithful, that you will reign with me with a rod of iron over the nations of this world. And then in chapter 20, after you see souls underneath the altar in chapter 6 of Revelation, crying out for vengeance, martyred souls crying out for vengeance, then you have in chapter 20 of Revelation, verses 4 through 6, beheaded souls who are raised, in a manner of speaking, around the throne of Jesus, reigning with him for a thousand years. And then you have this Hall of Fame of the Faithful in Hebrews 11. And then, uh, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these who have gone on before us, they're now witnesses. We're on the field. We're a, a battle. We're in the arena. They're in the grandstands, as it were, a great cloud of witnesses as it's our time, our time to shine. I suppose you could say that's metaphorical, but you could also argue that quite literally they are witnessing what we're doing now. Particularly when a few verses later in the same chapter 12 of Hebrews, we have not come to Mount Sinai. We've come to Mount Zion, city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
We've come to God. We've come to innumerable angels in festal clothing. We've come to Jesus, the mediator of a covenant, a new covenant. And we've also come to the spirits of righteous people made perfect. We've come to them. The spirits of righteous people made perfect. So for these and other verses that we could kick around, I, I believe that there's just this evidence that piles up that, to suggest that we continue to exist and be conscious even after the moment of death. But this man learned five things. This rich man who had gone on and, and was conscious after death, even to the point of a conversation with Father Abraham, he learns five things that we need to learn about existence after death. And one is that there is existence after death. The knowledge that this life is not all there is. There was life after death, and I don't know if you, you would call it life. In his case, you might call it existence, life after death. Eternal life is for the faithful. What he was experiencing is eternal torment. If he had ever had doubts about that in this life, now he knew. Now he knew. Eternal punishment, eternal pain, eternal torment. He wasn't living, he was rotting, he was burning, while his five brothers were still on earth. He was conscious of this. His thought processes were still working. He had the power of speech, he could feel pain, which is suggestive that disembodied spirits of righteous souls go to a place of comfort and the spirits of the wicked in a place of anguish. And we see that, you know, I gave a bunch of passages on the positive side of the coin. There are passages on the negative side of that coin, too. Angels are kept in chains until the day of judgment. Jude 6, 1 Peter 3, verse 19, speaks of Jesus in the spirit going to preach or proclaim. The spirits who are now in prison, well, they were disobedient in the days of Noah while they lived on the earth. So Jesus went to them in the spirit. Second Peter 2 says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I believe Jesus in the spirit was behind the preaching of Noah as a human being. And they were disobedient, but now they're in prison. The spirits that are now in prison. First Peter 3, 19. Or Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. And then you're hearing just a moment ago, again, speaks of of angels, if God did not spare, spare angels when they sin, but cast them into hell, Tartarus, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. That's angels, but then you shift to people in verse 9. Then, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the righteous, unrighteous rather, under punishment until the day of judgment. So prior to the day of judgment, prior to the return of the Lord, Prior to the resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous, there are unrighteous who are spirits, 1 Peter 3, 19, under punishment, which is exactly what we read about in Luke 16. It's exactly what we read about in Luke 16. While life is still going on on earth, here is a man under punishment awaiting the final day of judgment. But now he knew. Do you know as much as he knew now that, that the moment that you die is not the end? Do you absolutely know that? He knew now. It was too late, but now he knew. Would you live your life any differently right now? You knew as much as he did now. This life is not all there is. Good question. How about the realization that God will punish? It's so easy to pass the buck. Sin is never our fault. It's easy to rationalize. And we even have people who argue tooth and nail that a good and loving God would never punish people in, in hell. I don't know why this man was lost. 
I, th I think you can argue the love of money. That's the theme of the entire chapter, including the beginning as well as the end. He certainly had some money. Maybe he loved it too much. Maybe he was selfish and callous with the money that he had. Even Lazarus covered with sores, desired to be fed with the uh, what fell from the rich man's table. The dogs came to lick the sores and the man probably could care less. Seems to be the implication. Maybe he was a poor steward. Stewardship is one of the ideas found in this chapter of being faithful over little or much. Verse 10 and in verse 25. Abraham points out, you had much, and Lazarus had little, and now he has much, and you have, well, you have what was coming to you. What do we do with what we have? That's pretty important, isn't it? Perhaps he was just less than a full believer. You know, Father Abraham, you need to send Lazarus that he might rise from the dead and, and warn my my five brothers who are still on the earth if they have Moses and the prophets. No, 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 they won't be persuaded if, if, if with Moses and the prophets. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will, they will. Um, no, no, that's not the case. If they, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that someone should rise from the dead. Jewish unbeliever, can you imagine that? Even in the first century. I don't know why he was lost. Those are conjectures. What I do know is he was lost. And I do know it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the word of God. If you knew that God was serious about this punishment stuff. If you really knew that as much as he now knew it, you'd live your life any differently now? He now knew that there would be no second chances. Once his fate was sealed, he was locked in for eternity. It, it wasn't a matter of of, of going to hell and then going to heaven or going to um, temporal punishment and purgatory and paying his dues for a few years and, and then going to, to heaven. There was no temporal punishment. This was eternal. Perhaps he had made many resolutions in this life. One of these days, I'll get serious about God. One of these days, I'll repent. One of these, one of these days, I'll get my priorities in, in order. One of these days was gone. What I hate more than anything, I think, or just about more than anything, is saying a funeral for a non-Christian. You can make some general points about death, dying, and getting serious about God, but how can you comfort the family, really, and truly? This man realized there was no way out. A great chasm between the good side of things and the bad side so that there was no passing from one side to the other. No way out. What we do in the body on earth seals our fate. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10. We must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due for the things done in the body, whether it be good or evil. Chapter 6 of the same epistle, 2 Corinthians says in verse 2, now is the acceptable time, now is the day of salvation. And if you understood, if you really understood that there was no way out once eternity comes into view, and that your fate is sealed, good or bad, would you live life any differently now? If you knew as much as he now knew that truth. Sudden altruistic concern for other people's souls. He may have cared less about other people in this life. But now he has these five brothers. And he's tremendously concerned about them. The following taunting statement made in 
by an atheist made made William Booth a zealous Salvationist, founded the Salvation Army. I don't agree with everything that they promote, but uh, this did touch him and change his life. The atheist taunted him. If I believe what you Christians say you believe about our coming judgment, and that impenitent rejectors of Christ will be lost. I would crawl on my bare knees on crushed glass all over London, warning men night and day to flee for refuge from the coming day of wrath. That got to him. Do, do you believe all this stuff about a coming judgment and that impenitent rejectors of Christ really will be lost? Does it cause you to be more evangelistic. The last sentence on hell in the five volume Zondervan Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible. The last sentence on the entry on hell, page after page after page after page. It's a long entry on hell. And you get to the last sentence. This ought to be one of the impelling motives making evangelism the urgent business of all Christians. Amen. It should, does it? I've got these five brothers and I, I don't want them to come here. Please intervene. How many times could he have intervened in this life and, and his opportunities were now gone? But if you really knew that as much as he now knew it, would you live your life any differently now? Sense of personal accountability. I've had I just studies with all kinds of people, and and some will finally say something. I just don't know if there's enough to go on. There's not enough to go on. You don't think there's enough evidence to arrive at the correct conclusion to give honor to the God who put you here. If someone rises from the dead, then, then, then they'll repent. No, they have Moses and the prophets. And that is enough. Guess what? We've got even more than that. And we are accountable for how we weigh that evidence and how we act on it or not. Has God given us enough? Over and over and over and over again in Scripture. The answer to that question is a resounding yes. Our time is up, so I won't I won't read those passages. But your destiny is in his hands. How sad it will be if you have to say when it is too late. Why in the world didn't I listen? Why did I not listen and come to terms with this? But if you knew about your personal accountability as much as this man now knew, would you live your life any differently now? The things in Hades we need in the church. Knowledge of life after death, consciousness that God will punish, realization of no second chance, a concern for other people's souls, sense of personal accountability. Would you live your life any differently if you knew absolutely about these five things? God is giving you an opportunity. You have time and opportunity to repent. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Eric, would you lead us in prayer?